Hello, we are so excited that you chose to join us online at the Jefferson Church today. We believe that life is better connected and we wanna thank you for choosing to connect with us. So let's get excited, prepare our hearts and join the rest of our church family in worship. Oh, we 
you and we worship you this morning. Yes, let's worship him this morning. Come on, come on, come on. How many of you are glad that the Lord called our name and didn't leave us where we were? This morning, we are coming into his presence, running into his arms. So let's sing this out this morning. Father's arms 
Father's arms are open wide to us this morning and every day. It makes me think about my dad. Um, I have a great dad. I know that's not every circumstance in the room, but I had a good, I have a great dad. And uh, I have a son as well. And after we had our son, things change between you and your parents. You're no longer the favorite. Um, he's the first grandbaby, so I get it. It's fine. So my, my mom, when we go visit, she he lines it to the back seat to the car and that's where she goes first but my dad my dad comes to my door and he's standing there and he's like hey baby how you doing and I get to embrace him and it also makes me think this song of the prodigal son if you know the story you know that the son got his inheritance early he left his father's house and he squanders it he wastes it he spends it all and he's sitting in mud and mire and, and filth. And he says, okay, if I go back to my father's house, I can at least be a servant. I'll be a servant and I'll get fed and I'll have a place to live. And that's enough, that's what I'll do. So he picks himself up and he goes home. And his father sees him. He sees him far off. And instead of waiting on the porch or waiting at the house, he hikes up his robe, which was completely irreverent, and he runs to his son. He runs, he doesn't wait, he runs. He embraces him and he takes him in as his son, not as a servant, but as his son, as his child. And this morning, whether you're right next to your father like I am in my car and I just grab him, or whether you're far off, know that the Father is waiting to embrace you. Whether you just need to turn or whether you need to run, know that He's running towards you this morning. So as our prayer team comes forward, this altar is open. And I encourage you, I implore you to make this step this morning. Whether it's just a turn or whether it's a sprint, He's waiting. He's down here. He's waiting for you to just say yes and turn to him there is peace in his embrace there is love there is forgiveness there is fullness of life so this morning take this step take the turn take the sprint so father this morning we say yes to you we turn into your embrace we allow you to surround us with your love and your peace and your joy and your forgiveness. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus this morning. We thank you, Lord. We love you and we honor you this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Won't you come? There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory King of love had given up his life The darkest day in history Their own cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake and the veil was torn. 
what a sacrifice was made as the heavens roared. All hail King Jesus, all hail the Lord. At TJC, we love giving, and we've got multiple options to make it as easy as possible. You can mail a check to P.O. Box 674, Jefferson, Georgia, 30549. You can give online by going to jefferson.church give. You can text a gift amount to 706-686-2199. Or you can download the Church Center app search for the Jefferson Church, and easily start giving online through the Give tab. 
Again, thank you for your generosity. It truly does change lives. Now grab a pen and something to take notes on because we're in for an awesome message. I wanted to start off by saying that this series, I hope it's been so impactful for you in your life. The series we're in is called New Year, uh, Same God. And, and this idea that no matter what you're going through in your life, that, that God um, doesn't change. And so if he responded in certain ways to people in the Bible, his character is going to be the exact same. And it might not be the exact same circumstance or answer, but the character of the moment is going to be the exact same. And so we want to look at God's character. That's really what we're looking at. Not just people situations because how many of you know we all go through stuff and for some of us we go through what these biblical characters have gone through but it's God that never changes and it's his character that we can depend on can somebody say amen last two weeks uh, we've been talking about last week we talked about Jacob and how he struggled with his past and God helped him move go past his past and to see what was something that was going to be great ahead of him. Moses had the problem of insecurity. And for some of us, we have insecurities and that keeps us from really reaching out and going after God. But like Moses, God showed him a better way and a different way. Um, today, I want to talk about Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. The, the thing about Isaiah's life, he was known as the weeping prophet or the crying prophet. And the reason why is because he had a lot of tragedy in his life. And so whenever we talk about Isaiah, I just want you to know today is going to be one of those sermons that I think it's going to kind of hit everybody right square in the chest because we've all dealt with this. Today is what do you do when tragedy strikes? What do you do in the darkest hours, the darkest days of your life? Not just what do you do, but what is God's response? Hey, what is God's character in the midst of all that? Because your life is going to go up and down. Your life is going to change. Your life is going to have its pitfalls and its mountaintops. But God never changes. Can somebody say amen? God never changes. God stays the same. Yesterday, today, forever. He never, his character is the same. So he responds to us in the same manner in which he responded to Isaiah, who went through tragedy in his life. And so whether you've been through a loss, a tragic circumstance, emotional pain, um, an accident, a divorce, um, marital issues, whatever you're going through right now, um, God understands. And I believe it's the character of God that we can see that's going to help us in our life here today. So Father, we're again so grateful to be in your house under a roof that doesn't leak and a air conditioning that works and God we're, we're comfortable here we're so thankful for that we never want to take that for granted uh, so many people in the world don't have this I pray that you bless us in this time and this message God help it to reach and touch the lives that somebody in this room would be forever changed and marked uh, because of your word and the Holy Spirit we pray you bless us here today in Jesus name and everybody says amen and amen um People tend to use pain as an excuse to get away from God. Matter of fact, our knee-jerk reaction usually is when there's painful circumstances, we distance ourselves from God, don't we? We get mad. We say, God, you know, you did this to me. God, this is something that happened to me because of you. You didn't keep this from happening. The umbrella didn't work. You know, so, something went wrong. And, and for some reason, we, we attribute all the pain we're going through, and we assign that pain to God when it wasn't God that did it. We live in a fallen world, everybody. We live in in a miserable existence called earth. Perfection is not here. Perfection is in heaven, okay? And listen to me, God never promised us perfection. But for some reason, if things don't go just right, we get so mad at God, and God is going, I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't want you to distance yourself from me. I want you to draw closer to me. So our posture when we go through tragedy and loss and pain, our posture is to push away from God when God's posture is the exact opposite. It says in Psalms chapter 30, it says that the Lord is close. Everybody say close. Come on, say close. The Lord is close <clears throat> to those that are brokenhearted. So when we're doing this, God's trying to do this. It's, it's almost like the story Ashley was saying when she was up here. It's like everybody kind of distances yourself, but, but God's that father that comes around to your side of the car and wants to embrace you and get close to you. And, 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 and God is saying, hey, I'm trying to move towards you. That's the posture. That's the heart of the father. When you go through loss and when you go through tragedy and when you go through circumstances, you might want to blame God, but God is just trying to get closer to you in the 
the midst of all those things. And he wants to help us have a better response when pain comes. Because I want to give you one of the best, most encouraging, life-giving uh, phrases I can possibly give you this morning. Guess what? Pain is going to happen. <laughs> pain is coming. Who's that coming down the track? It's pain, everybody. Pain. Pain. <laughs> Is coming down the track. It's going to happen in our life. And what you need to see is God never promised us perfection. I don't, I don't understand why people get so mad at God, including myself. I'm not leaving me out of the equation. But God never promised perfection. This is earth. This is not heaven. In heaven, there's no crying. In heaven, there's no pain. In heaven, there's no agony. In heaven, there's no sadness. In heaven, the Krispy Kreme hot light is always on. Come on, somebody. I could go for a, we just got through with 21 days of prayer and fasting. This afternoon, I will have a Krispy Kreme donut and a nap. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm ready. It's, it's one of the good days. But the, heaven is where perfection is, not here. Matter of fact, Jesus promised, not on the screen, but he promised that in this world, you will have trouble. Verse on the screen, it's right here. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In other words, Jesus is saying, my plan in your pain is not to rescue you, but to help you stand strong in the middle of it, to help you see that, that the power comes from God, that when we run away from God, we're really cutting ourselves short. Psalms 34, one more time, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. In other words, he uses our bad moments and our bad days to your benefit. He uses them to our uh, betterment. So in other words, the painful season you went through, the issues that you face, it's not lost, it's not done, it didn't count for nothing. Your pain that you're going through right now, it's not meaningless. There is a better hope, a brighter future for you because God comes close to us. Can somebody say amen? amen? I can tell you this from personal experience, that every great spiritual experience I ever had came in a season of pain. You want to know why that is? It's because, let me ask you this, what do you learn from good days? Nothing. <laughs> you don't learn anything from good days. It's the bad days that you learn. It's the bad days that you learn, oh, I don't need to turn this way. I don't need to go that way. I don't need to say that again. I don't need to have this experience. Good days don't teach you anything, but bad days teach you an awful, awful lot. And in my life, what I have found is the greatest spiritual moments and encounters and experiences I've had with God have come out of bad seasons in my life. When I, was, when I was young, I, I got saved coming out of a bad season with, with some family issues and some struggles. Even as a young child, I realized I needed God in those moments because I was missing so much in my life from the traumatic family experiences that I went through when I was just a young kid. I was 13 years old. Matter of fact, when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I was 13. You know what happened before I was filled with the Holy Spirit? I got in trouble, and my mama rocked my world. Anybody know what I'm talking about when your mama rock your world? I, anybody, you need to rock your kids world right now. You know what I'm talking about? Like, it is coming in Jesus' name. And she, I mean, she took the door off the hinges in my room. I couldn't even lock the door in the bathroom when I went to the bathroom. Like, I had no privacy. She rocked my world. I had no TV. I, we didn't have, we didn't really have phones back then, but I mean, we kind of did. It was the bag phones. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. But like, like we, I didn't have anything. She rocked my world. She took me off a sports team. She took me out of everything. And she looked at me. She said, I'm taking everything you love. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> she rocked my world. She did. She then goes, the one thing you're not grounded from is you're going to go to this camp. We, I went to a winter retreat, or a summer retreat, kind of like what our kids are going to in the wintertime, a spiritual summer. And at that moment, that's where I met the Holy Spirit, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And you can ask my mom and you can ask my family. I was night and day different at 13 years old. That's why winter renewal is not just all the kids go off and have fun. There's life change that's going to happen up there in that conference this weekend, everybody. It happened to me. I'm an example of that. But it came out of a, a difficult, dark, woo mama, the, the dark season of my life. Coming to TJC, coming here seven years ago. I mean, we didn't walk out of Gainesville with rose petals and, and dandelions, y'all. I mean, it was, it was a tough season of life. And we, we found this great spiritual experience that led us here. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is that God can and will use your pain for your betterment. God will use that pain to help you with your experiences and your problems. They don't have to be problems, but really they can be platforms that God wants to use to do something amazing in your life. Can somebody say amen? You just have to recognize it. You got you to see that. Uh, when I was 
at the University of Georgia, we had a strength coach. His name was Coach Dave Van Hallinger. And I'll never forget the first day I walked in. You guys, when I was a senior in high school coming out, I was a buck 85 soaking wet. I mean, like I was, I was nothing. After my freshman year of college, y'all, I was 235. Boo! Like I, I grew. It was big. I didn't, it wasn't needles neither. It was the protein and working out. But anyway, um, I, uh, I, I was this big. I remember my coach always yelling at me, Dalton, no pain. Y'all can finish it for me. Right. No pain, no gain. No pain, no gain. And now, back then, it made sense because I was in the gym and working out and athletic. Now, I hate going to the gym, everybody. I hate it. And I get people that are like, that are like you know, bodybuilders and people go to the gym. You know them people. Like, like they, they, go to the, they go to the gym. They go to the gym and they get this lifter's high, and this weightlifter high. And I'm like, I have never experienced that a day in my life. <laughs> a weightlifter high. What kind of just demonic stuff is that? And then you get people who are runners. Y'all know people that are runners, right? You know how you know they're runners? They tell you. They're runners, yeah? And <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. My bad. My bad. <laughs> Their spiritual moment always starts off, well, I was running seven miles this morning, and God spoke to me. I was like, yeah, God will speak to me too because I'm almost DOA on the pavement right there. And runners, they'll say, we get this runner's high. I want to slap everybody and say they get a runner. There is no such thing as a runner's high. No way. The, the only running high I get running to the refrigerator to get ice cream. You know, that, that's a runner's high. That, that's God right there. God's all up in that one. But we always have this phrase of no pain, no gain. And, and, and essentially what that means is, is that everything we do, we try to resist pain. We try to resist problems. We try to resist issues in our life when actually it's the pain that serves a purpose. It, it's pain actually serves a purpose in our life. It helps to build us to the place where God needs us to be in our life. Think about it. Without, without you struggling, without you walking, without you doing things actively through your day, your muscles would deteriorate and you couldn't do anything. In other words, the pain and the struggle you go through is actually making you stronger for what God has in front of you. All right, that's good. That's good. I'll, I'll be up here. But I'll aim. Good job, Pastor. Amen. That's great. Isaiah went through the same thing. Isaiah had a painful experience, and he used it. He, he allowed God to use it to build him up to a better place. And I want to walk through Isaiah's experience for you. This prophet, this crying, uh, weeping prophet Isaiah, it starts off like this in chapter 6, verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died... In the year King Uzziah died, King Uzziah was a good king. King Uzziah had a lot of good qualities. He followed a lot of bad kings, and after him were a lot of bad kings. He was like the pinnacle of the moment in Isaiah's life. And this good king who was a good, good man and, and followed God and led Israel back to the Lord and was actually probably a friend of the prophet Isaiah's, this king tragically dies kind of with no excuse, no, no one there, and, and evil follows after King Uzziah dies. So King Uzziah dying is a, is a very, very bad thing. It's not just a blip in history. It's a bad thing in the nation of Israel. The entire nation is grieving Everyone is mourning. Isaiah is crying. He's weeping because Uzziah was a great king. So in the midst of this tragedy and in the midst of this suffering and in the midst of Isaiah's pain, Isaiah writes, in the year King Uzziah died, in the middle of all my struggles and all my issues, in the middle of all that, when I wanted to run away from God, that's when I saw God. That's when God revealed himself to me. And he saw a couple of things. First thing he saw, he said, I saw God and he was high and exalted. He was seated on a throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. What that means is back then kings had had long trains on their robes for every battle they won, for every uh, land that they conquered, for every kingdom they took over, and for how long they'd been reigning. It basically showed the greatness of their kingdom and the greatness of their rule. And Isaiah said, when I saw God, I saw that he never lost a battle. I saw he never came in second. I saw that he never got defeated. I saw that every time he stepped up to a battlefield, he won the battle in Jesus' name. I saw that when God, when I saw God, the train of his robe was so long and so big, I couldn't even and step into the room where he was. Can I tell you this morning, you serve a God that's great. You serve a God that's never lost. You serve a God that will not fail you, and if he didn't fail him in the Old Testament, he won't fail you right now in the New Covenant. Can somebody give God praise right now? He said, I saw God high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple, and above him were seraphim. Everybody's like, what's a seraphim? We, we think those are little fat babies with wings. That's not what a seraphim is, but... 
They were calling to one another. They were saying, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth, everything that happens is full of his glory. In other words, in the midst of your problems, God can still get glory. In the midst of your struggles, in the midst of your addictions, in the midst of your marital issues, in the midst of your relationships, in the midst of your depression, the Bible says that God can and will still get glory in the midst of your issues and your bad days. He says, I saw the Lord. They were saying, holy, holy. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook and the temple was filled. In other words, our life was kind of altered and it was shaking, but God filled that situation and God, God made everything whole. In essence, when bad things happened to Isaiah and he was in tragedy and he was in mourning and he was grieving and he was struggling, he was having a bad day. That first thing he did was he had a worship service. You know what this is right here? From highly and exalted all the way down to the temple was filled. That's a worship experience. What does that say to us that when we go through tough times, what's the first thing we should do? Worship God. It doesn't seem right. It's not our knee-jerk reaction. Our knee-jerk reaction is to get away from God. And, and, and Isaiah is saying, when I wanted to get away from God, instead, I pushed through all that pain. I pushed through all that grieving, and I ran towards God, and I began to worship him. Pastor Nick, why is that so important? Here's what worship is. Worship is my problems are big, my God is small. My problems are big, my God is small. My problems are big, my God is small. Then all of a sudden, you get in here, and we start singing songs like, all hell, King Jesus, all hell the savior of the world we start singing songs about God's greatness and all of a sudden you you have this paradigm shift in your life where you realize wow my problems are big but my God's bigger my issues might be big my addictions my relationship issues might be big but my God is bigger can we give God praise somebody it's this worship service that in the tough times my, my God's bigger than my issues and Isaiah said, yeah, king, the king Uzziah, he might have died, but I've got a God whose train filled the temple. I've got a God who angels are saying holy. I've got a God that when everything shakes in my life, he fills it and he makes it better for me in my life. That's how, the God that I serve. And so the character of God that we see in this first episode with, with Isaiah and, and meeting God or seeing God, here again, he saw God. The first thing that we see is when something bad is happening to me, God wants to reveal himself. God wants us to see him in the struggle and in the pain. And that's not always easy to see. But that's why in the midst, I, I challenge you, I dare you, I double dog, triple dare you. Come on, like, I, I dare you. In the, it, when you are having a bad day, flip on some worship, worship music and watch what happens. Uh, just turn, take all the bad things, all the, the, the country music, not bad, all the secular stuff. All, listen, and just put on some worship music and just start praising God and watch your attitude shift in that moment. I'm telling you, Chanel, uh, the way I know that uh, Chanel is going through a tough time, she doesn't always we, communicate that all the time. And so sometimes the way I have figured it out is I walk in the house and worship music is blaring in the house. I mean blaring. And I'm, I'm like doing this, and she's in there going, glory! I mean, she's like praying, and I'm like, she's going through a tough time. Why? She's worshiping God in those moments. She's trying to shift her perspective. My problems are big to my God is small. Now she's saying my God is big and my problems are small. And that's what God's trying to get us to see when tough things happen. The second thing Isaiah saw, Isaiah 6 verse 5, he says, woe to me. So he saw God. He saw this worship service happening. And then he says, woe to me, for I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a sinner. Man, I'm messed up. I don't deserve what I'm getting right now. And I live among people with unclean lips. Literally, Isaiah is saying, God, I messed up, but they really messed up. That's what he's saying. And sometimes you could pray that, Lord, I messed up, but Lord, they really messed up around me. I mean, they, they really some messed up people. He says, but they live among clean, unclean lips. But my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. In essence, what he's saying is, hey, God, I see this worship service. I see what's going on. In the midst of my pain, I look to you. But sometimes we need to be reminded that the pain that you're experiencing is not always somebody else's fault. It's not always the government's fault. It's not always grandma or grandpa's fault or the people that hurt you in your past fault. At some point, you have to take responsibility for some of the things in your life. The pain you're experiencing is your fault. Good to see y'all this morning. Hi, I'm Nick. Yeah. <laughs> Is, it's our fault. 
Sometimes we have to take respons- a lot of times we have to take responsibility for what's going on in our life. And he, he sits there in the midst of this presence of God, this worship service. He goes, oh, God, <laughs> I've messed up. Oh, God, I've done the wrong thing. Oh, God, I can't believe I made that mistake. Oh, God, I can't believe I said that. Oh, God, I can't believe I went this way. And I'm experiencing pain because of what I've gone through in my life. And the second thing that he sees is that when we see God clearly, when we get in that moment and we go towards God in our pain, we all of a sudden see what we've done. We all of a sudden see ourselves clearly. Now, listen to me. The Bible says that God does not condemn you meaning you dirty dog, filthy, stinking sinner, you how dare you be in my presence, get out of here, get right, and when you get everything right, you can come back. That's not what God does. The Bible says he convicts us, which means, hey, you went this way, let me pick you up and point you the right direction. That's all conviction is, everybody. That when we see God for ourselves, we then begin to see who we truly are, and we say these, these, these four words that, that we all need to say at some point. Sometimes the pain we're going through is our fault, and we need to change. That's a tough word to accept. Now listen, I'm not talking about tragedy and loss. That's a separate issue, and we'll get to that. But I'm talking about things that you know you had a hand in doing. Things that you know stuff, stuff went wrong. You know that you, and we get mad at God because we're in this situation when God's going, I didn't put you there, you put yourself there. And we're getting mad at us and, and mad at God. And sometimes we just need to change. The third thing that Isaiah sees, is he sees in in verse number six, he says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sins are atoned for. That's a sign of salvation, God saving us. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? In other words, there comes a moment where we worship God, we get right with God, but that's not the last step. There has to be another step, a next step moving forward. Now the thing is, okay, God, I've gone through pain, I've gone through emotional damage, I've gone through um, experiences, I've done all those things. Okay, I see you, I worship you, I realize that this pain is a platform that you want to use in my life. I repent of anything I've done wrong. Now, God, the question is, where do I go from here? What are you going to do with, how how are you going to make this pain have a purpose? And he goes, here I am, Lord, send me. In our darkest days, listen to me, and they're coming. If you haven't experienced them yet, they're coming. In the darkest days of our life, we need to look to God because we need to see how big he is and how small our problems are. We need to realize that sometimes we need to change, and if we change, the circumstance will change. But then also, we need to see that there is hope for our future. There's hope for the, give me that next slide. There's hope for our future, that, that, that we have the ability, once we see everything that's going on in front of us, now we see, okay, I can plant my feet on new ground and go in a new direction with God's help. And so many of us in this room, listen to me. I say this with as much care as I possibly can. We have allowed the pain of our past to handicap us from walking into the future. We, we have held on to the hurt and, and, and again, some of that has been our fault, but some of it is things that we could not, we could not help ourselves. I, I spoke with a lady yesterday that we saw up in Tennessee when we were there, and, and it was Friday night we saw her. And I've known her for a while, and her husband was just driving home from work one day, got sideswiped on the road and died on impact, and she's left there with three kids. What do you say to somebody that's going through pain like that? What do you say to somebody that's going through issues and problems? What do you you say to somebody who's going through addictions? What do you say to somebody who's going through a a divorce? What do you say to somebody who's really dealing with bad, hard, difficult issues? I'll tell you what you say. You look at them, and you you comfort them, and you care for them. You, You try to help them find God in the moment, and then you say to them, hey, look to God and say, if God took care of you through all that, God's going to take care of you in your future. If, if God can handle everything back here and God can heal all the wounds back here, don't you think God cares enough about your future ahead of you? And that as long as we are holding on to the past and holding on to the pain and holding on to the hurt, that's just more weight that we're having to drag forward where God wants us to go. When I believe God wants you to have freedom in your life. Freedom from sin, yes. Freedom from issues, yes. But also freedom from pain. Freedom from 
from problems and things that hold us back. Joseph said it like this. No, don't take my word. Joseph said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people. In other words, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the pain I experienced. I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. I wouldn't be out. Like, like me, I told you, I wouldn't have had the spiritual experiences I had were it not for the pain that I saw. And one of the biggest uh, things that we could do to make ourselves mature as believers is to witness and to notice that when pain comes into our life, it's not a negative thing, it's a test, and it's something God's using to gain for our life. Because if we don't have pain, we don't have gain. No pain, no gain. Paul says it like this, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Here again, we can redefine that bad day. And if as mature Christians, believers, listen to me, if as mature Christians, if we can redefine the pain and see it as a springboard God is using for us to go into the destiny that he has for us, everything changes. It all changes. DJ, you can come. Um, I want you to repeat something. Um, three words. I want you to say, this is good. Say it one more time. This is good. This is one of those phrases that has kind of helped me in my life. Um, I don't say it out loud a lot. I, I, I kind of say it, you know, internally. But it all comes from a story <laughs> that I heard. Um, and I'm not sure if it's true. It's on the Internet, so it's got to be true, right? Um, but I, I heard this story, and um, it goes like this. There was this royal prince, um, and this royal prince was out hunting, and he had this servant with him. And the servant loads his gun, and the prince gets up, gets ready to shoot this animal, this beast, and he shoots, and the, the gun misfires, and, and it blows the prince's thumb off. Well, he, gets, he, he looks at his servant, and he says, look at what you've done. And the servant goes, this is good. This is good. What do you mean this is good? Well, it's th this is good. And he always would say that. He would always say, this is good. This is good. This is good. Well, the, the prince got so mad, he threw the servant in jail. He said, you're, you're going to think about what you've done, and threw him in jail. So the, the prince gets all well, all better. He goes back out. He's journeying somewhere. And all of a sudden, he gets overtaken and overran by, by cannibals. And these cannibals take him off to their camp, and they're getting ready to eat him. They're getting ready to, you know, just tear him apart. And cannibals, maybe you don't know this, are really, really superstitious. So as they're getting ready to cook him and eat him, they see he's missing a thumb. Cannibals don't eat people that have missing body parts. If I ever see a cannibal, I'm going to be like, hey, what's up? How are y'all doing? Good, you know? <laughs> don't say it. Anyway, I... Um, they wouldn't eat him because he wasn't whole. And so they let him go. So that prince is walking back. He gets to his palace. He goes, man, I just, I need to make, I, know, I just had this life-changing experience. I need to make, I, I feel bad for throwing that, that servant in jail. So he goes against the servant, comes out, and he says, hey, listen, you, you blew my thumb off, and I was mad at you, but, but I forgive you. It's, it's all okay because I just had a crazy experience. He said, the experience was I went to can cannibals, and they were going to eat me, but I didn't have my thumb, and they let me go. I almost died. And the servant goes, this is good. What do you mean this is good? He said, if, if your thumb hadn't have blown off, I'd have been with you, and they'd have eaten me too. <laughs> Come on, say, this is good. This is good. I don't know why the tragedy happened to you, but I can tell you this is good. I don't know why you're experiencing loss and pain. I don't know why you're struggling what you're struggling through. I don't know why things are happening the way they're happening. But can I tell you something? I know what God is good, so I can say with all confidence, this is good. That we need to see life that way. That pain can either be a jail or it can be a school. Pain can imprison you and keep you from going where God wants you to go. Or it can be something that empowers you to move forward and show you where God wants you to be in your life. So, so quickly, I just, I really felt like the Lord wanted me to, to give you these three quick things and, and we're good on time, but I just, there's three things that you're in this room and you're, you're going through struggles and issues and you're, in a, you're not in a bad day, you're in a bad season. <laughs> You've had a couple of bad years, you know, bad doctor's report bad relationship issues, mental health issues, depression, anxiety, like you're just, you're going through the ringer. Pastor Nick, what can I do? Number one, from the example of Isaiah, number one, stop running from God and start running to God. Stop running from him and start going to him. 
He's not far away from you. you. You feel like God's far away. That's the enemy trying to convince you God doesn't care about you. He's actually closer than he was before because you're going through pain. I feel like God is a lot like my wife, Chanel. When, when my kids go through painful issues, like if, they're, if they get hurt, I just like sit there and go, let's see how they handle this, you know? Chanel doesn't do that. They get hurt and she's up and she runs to them and she checks on them and everything. And Why? Because she's a good parent. <laughs> God's a good God, that he wants to run towards you. Isaiah 55, verse 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And I felt like the Lord had something for me to say directly to somebody today. So I just need you to listen. If you didn't listen to anything else, maybe this is for you. But I hear the Lord say to somebody in this room, You have been running from God for a long time. You've been running because of pain, tragedy, or excuses, or experiences, whatever it is. You've been running from God, and your life is not good. I feel like the Lord wanted me to tell you it's not going to get better. It's not going to get any better. And you think that blaming God for what happened hurts his feelings. (laughs) You think that blaming God for what happens is punishing him. It's not punishing him. It's punishing you. To step out of that season of pain and anguish and and tragedy, step out of it, get away from what's holding you back, and start stepping, running towards God. I feel like somebody need to hear that today. Stop running away from God and run to God. Run to the Father. The second thing is you need to take the steps now to grow from that experience, to grow from the tragedy, to allow God to use it to make you somebody that you were not before. Can I tell you something? You are a result of the experiences you've had up to this point. And if you use those experiences to your advantage, God wants to use them to your advantage to push you and to help you become the better person, to, to become a better believer in Jesus, a better follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus never promised perfection. He promised trouble was coming. But guess what? That pain builds us up and eventually makes us more like Christ. It pushes us closer to the Father, closer to glory, and closer to Him. You want to know, I don't know if you can say this in church, you want to know why bad days kick your tail? You want, can I say that in church? You want to know why? We're in Jackson County. I can say that. Come on. You want to know why bad days kick your tail? You want to know why? You don't have spiritual depth. You don't have a spiritual weight to your life. You're just superficial on top of the water. You're like a float in the middle of the ocean. It's going to go wherever the, but, but I, I believe God wants to make us cruise liners where we just, we sink in the water a little bit and waves crash against us and we, we cut through the waves like a boat, not like a float. I think some of us in this room need a little more spiritual depth in our life. First Peter chapter 2 says this, like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. You say, Pastor Nick, what, what steps are you talking about? How can I grow through this? Here's how you grow. You come out of tragedy and you take a step towards God. What does that mean? Maybe you get baptized. Maybe you give your life to Jesus today. That's probably what most of us, some of us need to do. We need to take the next step in baptism. We need to join groups. Get in with Grief Share. Get in with the encouragers, with maternal warriors. Get in with some groups, some men that can help us grow like like our men's groups. Maybe some of us need to start serving and through the tragedy of our life, we begin to serve other people and that we, we receive healing and comfort. Maybe some of us need to start tithing and actually trusting God with what he has given us. And I just believe that tragedy doesn't have to be tragedy. If you grow through it, there's something better on the other side. But if you don't grow, then it's just tragic. God has a way of turning tragedy into triumph. And it can happen. I know you're sitting there going, no, not me. Yes, you. It can happen. And in your year that King Uzziah died, I'm telling you right now, you can see the Lord. You can see the goodness of God in your life. The third and final thing, and we'll be done. And this is key. Now, this is important. If you really want to get through the bad days and you really want to get through the tragedy and you really want to allow all the past and the pain to be released from your life, yes, you need to go to God. Yes, you need to allow God to help you grow. But number three, he's growing you to a place of purpose. In other words, the pain that you're going through right now, you need to allow God to use what you've been going through to help other people. You need to allow God to use what you've been going through to help other people. There are people in this room 
that I know stories and I know issues that they've gone through. And because they've stepped out of it, guess what they're doing now? They're helping people that are going through the same thing they went through. Can I tell you, that's how God redeems us. That, that's how God turns beauty, turns ashes from ashes to beauty. That's how God turns our mourning into dancing. That's what he does is when we realize, God, you're bigger than this problem. You're bigger than this issue. I don't have to be chained to my past, but I can move forward in baptism and serving and, and being a follower of Jesus Christ. And when I do that, you're going to turn my pain into purpose, and I'm going to help other people that went through what I went through. That's what God does. That's how he redeems our past and redeems where we're at. And I just need you to hear this for me. I need you to hear this today. Last thing I'm going to say, you got to hear this. What you think disqualifies you from God using you is actually the thing that qualifies you. <laughs> I'm going to say it one more time. Some of y'all missed that. What you think disqualifies you from being used by God is actually the thing that God is going to use to qualify you to help other people. You say, well, I'm an alcoholic. God can't use me. God wants to use that season, help you to grow out of it, and help other people that are going through the same thing. Well, I've been divorced. It was my fault. Okay, ask for forgiveness. God wants to help you to grow out of that season to help people that are going through it. Well, I've had pain. I've had loss. I deal with depression. I deal with anxiety. God can't use me. Yes, he can. Yes, Yes, he can. In the worst tragic moments of your life, you can see God. You can see how big he is and how small your problems are. You can grow out of the pain. You can see the greater purpose in your life. And when you step on the other side, you look back and remember how faithful God was. And you can encourage people to say, God will be faithful to you too. He'll help you in your life. The Bible backs it up. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, all praise to God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. He's merciful, a source of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. I'm here to tell you, listen to Pastor Nick, <laughs> your pain was not sent to destroy you, your pain was sent to grow you. Your pain was not sent to, to take you out, your pain was sent to develop you and give you a purpose because with no pain, there's no gain. Can we bow our heads and close our eyes just for a moment? God, what a tough word, <laughs> what, a, what a tough season. It's, it's not easy to hear this, especially in the season that some of us are going through. It's not easy to to develop as a believer and realize that when we're going through addiction and when we're going through problems and sadness and depression and loss and tragedy, it's not easy to hear, hey, pick your head up. Hey, look to God. Hey, run to the Father. Hey, listen, God's going to use this to grow you. Hey, listen, God's going to use this to, to your benefit and to his glory. It's not easy to hear that. But, oh, God, if we can hear some other people that say, yep, God's word's true. It happened for me. I was divorced. I thought my life was over, and God gave me purpose. I lost a spouse to death or to tragic circumstances, and you know what? God turned it around, and he gave me purpose. God used the pain to grow me. God used the pain to make me more like him. You know what? I used to be addicted, and, and I used to think it was all about that, and now I've realized, man, I went through those things so that I could help people on the other side of that. I pray that today we would experience the presence, the glory of God than in the, the year that King Uzziah died in the most tragic circumstances of our life that we'll see God. They don't need to see a pastor. They don't need to experience a church. They don't need to experience a sermon. They need to experience the presence of God in their life. And I pray they do that right now in this room, in this moment. In this room and in this moment in the name of Jesus. I believe the Lord is saying that your problem does not define you. Your past does not define you. That God does. That he will use these tragic circumstances to point people to Jesus through your life if you'll allow him to. Today you're here and you say, Pastor Nick, I'm running away from God. I haven't been getting closer to him. I've actually been getting farther away from him. You know the answer to that, the way you come back, repent. The way you come back is that conviction, that pull on your heart. Oh yeah, that's me, Pastor Nick, you're talking about me. We repent and we turn back towards God. 
And there are people in this room that you've allowed pain and loss and tragedy to pull you away from God when he's actually saying, hey, I want you to get closer to me. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Nick, I'm further away from God than I need to be and I need to get it right. I need to get right with God. I need to make a fresh start, a fresh commitment. Or maybe for the first time you've never given your life to Jesus and today you want to surrender your life to him. If that's you in this room, heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to bring you up to the front. But you say, Pastor Nick, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to make a fresh start, a fresh commitment. If you're here, would you just shoot up your hand right now and say, Pastor Nick, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to give everything I've got to him. I'm tired of living with what I'm living with. I'm tired of going through what I'm going through. And today, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. Anybody here? That's me. I see one hand. Anybody else today? Two? Anybody else? Three? Anybody else? Say, today's the day for me. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. Three people. Three people. Four. Father, I thank you so much for the hands that were raised today. Now, if, if you raise your hand, that's a sign of belief. The Bible says to confess and believe. And as you raise your hand, you say, God, I'm far away and I need you. God, I'm sorry. I repent. I accept the, your son, Jesus Christ, that died for my sins. And all I have to do is put my faith in him and I can be saved today. There are four people that are getting ready to give their life to Jesus in this moment. I want to ask that you repeat this prayer after me. But let it be a prayer of faith. Not just something you recite, but a prayer of faith in your life that you know today is going to be different and you'll never be the same. Come on, pray with me. Say, dear Jesus, come on, everybody pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, for my mistakes, for everything I've done wrong. Say, God, I'm sorry. Say, today I put my foot in the ground and I turn away from my life of sin, from neglecting you, and from running away from you and today I run to you I need you God I need you to save me I need your grace and I need your mercy say father forgive me say I surrender my life to Jesus and I will never be the same in Jesus name we pray and everybody said amen Hey, four people just gave their life to Jesus. How awesome is that, everybody? Come on, let's give God praise. Woo! Did you make a decision for Christ today? We would love to provide you in your next steps with your newfound relationship with Jesus. If you're interested in taking your next steps at TJC, please visit jefferson.church slash next steps or click the next steps tab on the top of the homepage. Thank you for joining us online today at TJC. We can't wait to see you next Sunday.